to go and had taken to scavenging for berries. They were all foreign, but a whisper of a memory from her years with her nursemaid Finula had warned her to rub them on her wrist first, to see if they raised any reaction. Most of the time, too much of the time, they did. But every now and then she'd stumble across a bush sagging with the right ones, and she'd gorge herself before filling her pack— Fishing inside the pink and blue stained canvas interior, Elid dug out the last handful, wrapped in her spare shirt, the white fabric now a splotchy red and purple. One handful, to last until she found her next meal. Hunger gnawed at her, but Elid ate only half. Maybe she'd find more before she stopped for the night. She didn't know how to hunt, and the thought of catching another living thing, of snapping its neck or bashing in its skull with a rock. She was not yet that desperate. Perhaps it made her not a black beak after all, despite her mother's hidden bloodline. Elid licked her fingers clean of the berry juice, dirt and all, and hissed as she stood on stiff, sore legs. She wouldn't last long without food, but couldn't risk venturing into a village with the money Manon had given her, or toward any of the hunter's fires she'd spotted these past few weeks. No. She had seen enough of the kindness and mercy of men. She would never forget how those guards had leered at her naked body, why her uncle had sold her to Duke Parrington. Wincing, Elide swung her pack over her shoulders and carefully set off down the hill's far slope, picking her way among the rocks and roots. Maybe she'd made a wrong turn. How would she know when she'd crossed Terrison's border anyway? And how would she ever find her queen, her court? Elide shoved the thoughts away, keeping to the murky shadows and avoiding the splotches of sunlight. It'd only make her thirstier, hotter. Find water, perhaps more important than finding berries, before darkness set in. She reached the foot of the hill, suppressing a groan at the labyrinth of wood and stone. It seemed she now stood in a dried stream bed wending between the hills. It curved sharply ahead, northward. A sigh rattled out of her. Thank Aneth. At least the Lady of Wise Things had not abandoned her yet. She'd follow the stream bed for as long as possible, staying northward, and then... Elite didn't know what sense exactly picked up on it. Not smell, or sight, or sound. For nothing beyond the rod of the loam, and the sunlight, and the stones, and the whispering of the high above leaves was out of the ordinary. But... There. Like some thread in a great tapestry had snagged, her body locked up. The humming and rustling of the forest went quiet a heartbeat later. Elid scanned the hills, the stream bed. The roots of an oak atop the nearest hill jutted from the slope's grassy side, providing a thatch of wood and moss over the dead stream. Perfect. She limped for it, ruined leg barking, stones clattering and wrenching at her ankles. She could nearly touch the tips of the roots when the first hollowed-out boom echoed. Not thunder. No. She would never forget this one particular sound, for it too haunted her dreams both awake and asleep. The beating of mighty leathery wings. Wyverns. And perhaps more deadly, the iron teeth witches who rode them, senses as sharp and fine-tuned as their mounts. Elite lunged for the overhang of thick roots as the wing beats neared, the forest silent as a graveyard. Stones and sticks ripped at her bare hands, her knees banging on the rocky dirt as she pressed herself into the hillside and peered at the canopy through the latticework of roots. One beat, then another not even a heartbeat after, synced enough that anyone in the forest might think it was only an echo. But Elide knew. Two witches. She'd picked up enough in her time in Morath to know the Iron Teeth were under orders to keep their numbers hidden. They'd fly in perfect mirrored formation.
so listening ears might only...